hoping that we're going to get more people coming from lunch soon. Uh, but I know that we're pushed for time, so we're going to get started. Um, I want to start by asking who in the audience is married or has a long-term partner. Okay. So I want to ask if these story, this story resonates with you. Uh, you're on holiday with your spouse, and you're driving along, and you get lost. Husband is driving. Wife is navigating. What happens? I'm going to ask this husband over here. What happens? Disaster. Disaster, yeah. She cannot navigate if her life depended on it. And so it creates a lot of tension, right? But does your wife ever say to you, why don't we stop and ask somebody? Does that happen? Never. Okay. Well, with most husbands, it does. Right, ladies? Yes. And what, is the, what does your husband say? No. Why? No need to ask. No need to ask. So... Part of what I'm going to try to work on with you guys today is I'm going to try to explain why that disaster happens to all of us in terms of the assumptions that men and women bring to the situation. You ready for that? <clears throat> You'll notice that I have as the starting slide the Tower of Babel because in my experience, this kind of language barrier, assumptions barrier exists between men and women and it plays out in a marriage, it plays out with friendships, and it for sure plays out at the tops of organizations. Uh, my day job is mostly working with chief executives of large businesses and helping them to be better at their jobs. I work with a lot of successors to CEOs and CEOs themselves. So as you can imagine, the bulk of my client base is male at the moment. I also do large-scale change consulting work in which I help women move into bigger roles. At the moment, I'm working in the Middle East with one of the big energy companies, helping women move into chief executive roles for the first time in history. And we had two appointed last year in the largest company in the Emirates for the first time in history. Part of what I'm doing there is I'm working with the women, moving them in, helping them settle in, working with the pipeline of women below them, building their leadership capability, and most importantly, working with the men who are leading those organizations to teach them about gender culture and to expand their horizons about how we bring different assumptions, we bring different skills, we bring different capabilities to leadership. A <clears throat> couple of important things. And part of what I'm hoping to do here is to give you some tips to take away that will help you as an individual leader, but also maybe help your company think about these issues a bit. Part of what we know from research by now is that whatever majority or minority population you're thinking about, if you have only 10% of the minority group, they do not have a voice in whatever the majority is. We happen to be talking about gender at the moment, but this is true of every kind of diversity. 25% is what you need as a minimum to have a voice, okay? And 30% is where you need to be to begin to change the culture as the minority, okay? So numbers really, really matter. Have any of you seen this new Pixar film about toxic masculinity? Anybody? One, okay, our youngest person and gentleman at the back, excellent. So we have two people. I would highly recommend it. It's a few minutes long. Uh, it's a bit Americocentric, and I'm from New York originally, so I'm sorry about that. But <clears throat> very, very funny and very resonant about what happens when women are introduced into an all-male culture in leadership. Part of what we know now, uh, Deloitte did some research last year, which actually was published in December 2018, uh, in which they basically identified that with 7,000 different organizations across 60 countries, the average number is 15% female board directors at this stage, 15, one five. 
which means that they're below that 25% of having a voice, and they're definitely below the 30% of actually making an impact on the culture. 75% of the organizations, the 7,000 organizations, have one woman. Uh, but part of what we know is that you need a minimum of three women on your board to be able to actually get a distinguishment. By this I mean, if we have one person, let's say we have this lovely young woman over here as a board member, okay, she will be looked at by the other board members, thank you very much, um, as being representative, every perspective she has is representative of all women worldwide. Have you ever been in that situation where somebody says to you, what would a woman say? And they assume you can speak for all women. Well, we can't, can we? When you have two, what happens is, let's say it's these two, because they happen to be sitting up front. The men in the room mix them up. Now, you might say to me, it's difficult to mix them up. They look different. They sound different. They're different ages. The men will call you by her name and you by her name. They will mix up who said what. Believe it. We add then a third person. Let's say this is our third female director over here. Suddenly, there's three different women directors with three different perspectives. It takes three. So it's important for you to understand this when you're actually advising your senior leaders about these issues. So, why are men and women different? And I'm gonna come back to you sitting in the car. There's a guy called Franz Deval who is a primatologist. He studies primates. He's Dutch and he has been doing longitudinal studies on primate zoos and animals in the wild as well for 20 years or more. And he's written a book recently called Our Inner Ape because we share a lot with apes, as you know. Part of what they have looked at is how men, how male gorillas and female gorillas in the population of only males or only females, how do they behave? So you'll see in this particular photograph, we have an alpha male who is baring his teeth. Because the primary way in which a male gorilla becomes alpha is by fighting or threatening to fight, right? They either fight other gorillas, beat them, and then move up, or else they show you, hey, look at how big my teeth are. Look at how big my muscles are. You don't want to mess with this. Right? So that's what's going on. And they create a structure of hierarchy where the junior male gorillas all want to become the alpha because it's the best place to be. You have most power, you have submission from all the other male gorillas, and you have your choice of females to procreate with and create babies with your genetic code going down into the next generation. So it's an obvious thing for junior male gorillas to want to go up. What do they do? Junior male gorillas pair up. And they basically wait for a guy above them to be tired or just post lunch or sick. And then they attack together. When they beat that guy, one of them goes up. And then they kind of shake hands and say, thank you very much. And then the same thing happens at that level to go up and up and up. Now let me stop here and say, women, have you ever seen this happen in the workforce? Show of hands. Pairing up of guys. So here we have one, yeah, okay, we're getting. Now men, does this actually sound like it's a familiar thing? I think the men are terrified of me. <laughs> we're getting no smiles at this table at all. Uh-oh, what is she gonna say next? So important for us to be alert to this because the issues are about status. And I'm going to come back to the husband and wife in the car. The men are actually worried about how they will be perceived by somebody if you say, I don't know where I am. Can you tell us how to get from A to B? There's a status issue. Women don't feel this way. We don't have that issue, right? We're happy to say, we don't know where we are, let's ask somebody who does. Okay, now, nothing wrong with what they're doing, but let's talk about how the females are. So you think about 
female gorillas, what are they doing? They have two jobs in the troop. One is to have babies and keep them alive. And the second is to go out, gather nuts and berries for the troop. So on the day that I have to go out and gather nuts and berries, I'm going to leave my most prized possession, my child, with another female in the group. And tomorrow, she's going to leave her baby with me. So what happens is you get these phenomenal bonds of trust between the different females because they have to rely upon each other for life and death. And what you get is a flat hierarchy, flattened. Now this translates into, according to the research that we know, in humans as females actually decreasing the actual differences between us to try to emphasize commonality, okay? And males often being in situations where they are trying to top each other. And there was a fantastic, there's a woman called Deborah Tannen, who is one of the world's leading linguistics experts on gender issues. She has a fantastic short clip of four boys on a playground doing this competitive thing, where one boy says, I threw the ball up to the top of this. The next boy says, I threw my ball up to the sky. The third one says, I threw my ball up to heaven. And you think he's kind of won that round until the a final fourth boy says, I threw my ball up to God. He won. So there's this positioning that goes on, and it's a kind of positioning that the boys know is not even true. They're not even saying from a status point of view stuff that's true, but the positioning actually is still happening. And part of the reason I'm telling you this is because this kind of positioning goes on in group meetings, which are dominated by men in, in almost all com companies that are big. And women don't know what to make of it. Women don't know what to do with it. Women don't understand it. So I'll give you a short example. Um, I worked years ago with a woman who was the first uh, board member of KPMG globally. And she told me that she had two members of her team come to her, one woman and one man. Both had been at the same meeting, and they both told her different stories. The woman came and said, I was at that meeting, and I was one woman. There were nine guys, and they were all yelling at each other. They were yelling so much, it was like watching children. So I just sat back and waited till there was a pause. And then I said, may I make a point, please? The man came to his boss and said, can you believe she thinks she needs to ask permission to contribute? So the assumptions that women are bringing to the party at the top are very, very different to the assumptions that men are bringing uh, to the same meetings. And this is challenging because when women do move up, they're often in the minority, and a very significant minority. One of the things that a lot of the research on both animals and humans shows uh, is that people make a decision about whether or not to see you as credible within less than a second. And part of the way that they do that is the body language that you have, the way in which you stand. So this Superman uh, picture on the left, does anybody know who that woman is on the right? Anybody know who that is? Yes. IMF Christine Lagarde, exactly. And I love it because she's doing that kind of Wonder Woman pose, as it's become known, all right? Wonder Woman pose, where she's got her, you know, she's basically kind of owning the space, so to speak. Um, part of what they have found in research, so neurological research, is that if you hold that pose for two minutes, your brain's chemistry believes you're dominant, believes you're authoritative, believes you're confident. So tip for all of you, men and women, if you want to go into, if you have to go into a big important meeting and you have to come across as confident, hold that position in the bathroom for two minutes beforehand and your brain then believes that you are authoritative. Um, I also love the juxtaposition of the gentleman next to her because you can see her positioning has actually established a relationship right there. <clears throat> so the research shows that in both animals and humans, we are looking at a scale that on one hand has domination in the form of authoritative. 
On the other end of the scale, we have subordination. So what happens with subordination is animals will bow, they will you know, go down, they'll make themselves small, and humans do something similar. So this is from uh, a Japanese um, slide, really, which is actually in Japanese culture, if people take your card, they look at your card to see how senior you are and determine on the basis of your title how low to bow, right? So what, what the animal and human research shows is that people who are subordinating themselves, make themselves smaller, take up as little room as possible, even go pigeon-toed, put their, sh their elbows in, bow, make themselves small. Now, some of us actually, when we're scared, that's what we do. And if you have to go into a presentation, that's the worst possible thing you can do because people will not believe you're credible if you start doing that. So it's very important to know this. Now, if we look at this scale, which I have kind of put together based upon other people's research, but I kind of put something visual so that we can see it, you have that authoritative style over on the right, and you have an approachable style, as they call it, on the left-hand side. In general terms, in most cultures, men are encouraged, boys are encouraged, to come across as authoritative, take up space. And in general terms, females are taught to be approachable, nice, friendly, which is the left-hand side of the scale. When you start having, what, when women look for, like at the males, we get that kind of KPMG perception problem, right? They're acting like boys. That's part of what happens. But what happens when the other, the other, the other direction is males look at a more female leadership style and what happens over here on this end? What, what, do, what do women get called who go too far into the authoritative space? Sorry, I couldn't hear that. I'm going to just come down slightly. Sorry? Bossy. That's a nice version of it. What else? Something that rhymes with witchy. <laughs> Absolutely. Something that would be seen by women as assertive is read by men as aggressive. The same activity could be done by men and be seen as assertive, but with women it's seen as aggressive. So it's extremely dangerous moving into that territory, but if you don't be authoritative, you're not going to be seen as credible. You're not going to be taken seriously. So navigating this becomes very challenging. And part of what I would say to you is I want you to look at that scale. Think about yourself. Think about your natural style. Think about whether you have a range. Can you move to the left? Can you move to the right? And let me give you an example of this. Imagine yourselves at a market and you are bargaining for a carpet that you really want. At some points in this process, you want to be very approachable and you want to actually say to the guy who's selling the carpet, what a stunning carpet so many you know, so, so, knots per square inch, such beautiful colors, etc. You want to be approachable. But at another point, you want to be able to say, I'm not paying more than boom, right? Authoritative, credible, tough. And you might have to switch one minute to the next between those kind of areas. So you have the ability to flip. But I would say become conscious of this. Practice the ones that you're not so comfortable with because you're going to have to bring those into the workforce if you want to be successful at the top. Okay. So part of what we have found is that there are three big challenges. Women's style is read as weak or aggressive. The second is it's very hard for women to network with senior men in segregated cultures particularly. So I'm conscious I'm in India where some Parts of society are more segregated from a gender point of view than others. We also have people from the Middle East here where there's a lot more segregation in terms of what's acceptable. So I'm doing work, as I said, in the Emirates where the women that I'm working with who are at chief executive level cannot socialize informally outside of the walls of the office with men because they're married and it would be seen as improper. So they have to do all of their networking, all of their influencing in the office. And men are not restricted like that. 
Men can go have a coffee. Men can go out for a weekend together and do, do activities, and the women cannot. So it becomes more challenging in societies where there is gender segregation, and you have to get quite creative, ladies, about how you're going to do this, and to think about it maybe together. Um, and finally, this point about critical mass. If you do not change the culture at the top, which is usually changing the men themselves, you will not achieve critical mass, by which I mean over 30%. Uh, because the women can be appointed, but if they're not happy, this is what they're going to do. They're going to jump. So it becomes absolutely fundamental for men and women in leadership roles to be thinking about these issues and solving the issues together. That's it for me. Thank you.